So, I mean, this is kind of what I expected. Some idea, lots of people have some idea of what operationalization or operational engineering manuals is. A couple of honest souls have said they don't have any idea, but absolutely fine. Um, some people have a decent idea, but nobody so far says they have a very good idea. And you're like, dummy, that's why we're here to find out what <laughs> if I knew if I had a great idea what operationalizing it would be here. I get one of the other great sessions. Thank you all for participating. I appreciate it. But this Brianna has done this slide a lot. I have to, I've never used it before, so I usually use the in, in Zoom um, only feature. All right. So, what is operationalization? What is operationalizing, and so on? And why do you worry about it? So the question is, it relates to variables. I and mean, the question is, how do we operationalize the variables? And you study them whenever um, in a, a research methods class, you're hearing the instructor say that over and over, are you going to operationalize that? So what does that mean? It, it, operationalizing is defining a concept or variable in such a way that it can actually be measured or identified, or in other words, operated on. Um, you answer the question when you operationalize how will I know this variable when I see it? And how will I record or measure it or changes to it? So for example, if we were going to do a study of um, you know, asking whether or not students, college students who are more socially active are also more successful academically than those who are less socially active, we need to operationalize what the concept socially active is. So we might have a proxy for that, you know, think about it. People who are active in, in student organizations, who are members of student organizations, or um, students with leadership positions in, in organizations. We also need to operationalize achievement. What do we mean by academic achievement? She can get we can measure that. Yeah. Yeah, if you can get closer to sure. them. Yeah. yeah, and you can even pull it towards, yeah, they're saying they can't, like you sound too far. I'm so. sorry, I mean, what I get closer, that might be I'm better. I'm <laughs> laughing, everybody just saying that. So. Um, am I too loud for you guys in the room? No, okay. All right. no. All right. So um, achievement we might measure as, um, or operationalize as great by average. Of course, if we say, you know, we're trying to say a high grade by average or a higher grade by average, we need to specify of a baseline and a level. Where are we going to cut that off? So, and this is my shameless plug for the book that we can then the um, assessment coordinator and collections <laughs> management. I she has a very long title, I can never remember it. Um, just published it out. Planning assessment for libraries of fundamental series from ALA, where we talk about operationalizing. Um, so why should we worry about this? Why is it important? When we're thinking about measuring human activity, there are two basic types of data that we collect, indirect and direct. Direct evidence or direct data for assessment or research is you know, what we actually see or can gauge ourselves what people are doing. Things like observation. If we're, if we're observing you know, student behavior in the library, we're actually seeing it. Um, if we're like using a rubric or, or doing a pre and post test, that's direct evidence. We're, we're actually seeing you know, how maybe a student's um, performance has improved or knowledge has improved based on an instruction session. Indirect evidence, on the other hand, is when we ask people to tell us what they've done, what they've experienced, how they've changed, um, if they're better at something. And that's the kind of data that we when we're you know, asking people to tell us about their lived experience, I mean, it's a very valid approach to collecting assessment and, and, and other types of research data. But typically we're collecting indirect evidence. We're asking people to tell us on surveys, through interviews, through focus groups, how they've changed, what they've experienced and so on. This is where operationalization, one of the places where it's always important, but this is one of the places it becomes especially important, especially when we're conducting surveys. Um, which we tend to do a lot in library assessment, right? Surveys are great. They're 
wonderful instruments for collecting a lot of data relatively quickly and fairly easily, especially with the tools that are available now. You can automate so much. You can you know, conduct your surveys online. Um, you can also collect data from large numbers of respondents. Um, you're not limited to, to talking to people who are just in your immediate geographic area. And also if, it's, if they're you know, subjects that are a little bit more touchy, surveys are anonymous in a way that interviews and focus groups never can be. That makes them really good for collecting data about topics that are sensitive, but especially about topics that are pretty straightforward and don't require a whole lot of nuance. So that is a big caveat that I think we tend to overlook when we're constructing surveys and, and conducting surveys, that question of nuance. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about two studies that were conducted in the 1980s that are really important, but I feel haven't been as influential as they should have been. But first, we have another poll. Um, I want you to look at this next list and indicate, and it's, it's, you can indicate as many answers as you'd like. It's not a, you know, it's multiple choice, as many answers as, you, as you'd like which of these things constitutes a use of the library? And the um, number is 187452. Okay, we'll give it just another minute. All right, so we have you know, uniform consensus that emailing a question to the reference or research services department of a library is an instance of library use. Submitting an ILL request for a journal article that you receive as a PDF um, is also library use, but then you know, variability in terms of these other instances. And all of you, I'm assuming, unless you have very strange hobbies, are connected with libraries, librarianship, electronic resources, scholarly publishing in some way. So you all, I think we can assume, have a better understanding than most of the variances of you know, using the library, what people do in, in academic and research libraries. Um, interesting, only a little over half said that checking library hours on the library's website is an instance of use. No judgment, I'm just observing. So two authors, first Abraham Bookstein, who was a professor at the Graduate Library School at the University of Chicago, this is 1982, um, did a survey of students in the GLS. These were master's students in the GLS. And um, it was followed up by one of his students, James Kidston, who did a study with students in the business school at University of Chicago in 1985. Um, so what Bookstein was looking at, what he was interested in, you know, he said, so when we ask people on a survey, did you use the library? And we don't explain what we mean by that. When we don't operationalize that, people have very different understandings of what exactly that means. He says, you know, if we ask 100 people, did you use the library last year? And 50 said yes. Um, and we just interpret that response as being accurate. We, we may be missing out on a number of other people who used the library but didn't understand that they were using it. So what the two of them did, the model that they used is from psychology. This is a really fascinating approach, I think. It's called um, a Rash Scaling Model Analysis for Concepts. And um, the, Eleanor Rash is the researcher who developed it a long time ago. 
um, it's item response theory. So it's a way of getting at kind of like the core and essential elements of a concept. So the, the one that she uses is, you know, what is a typical bird? What characteristics does a typical bird have? Um, I think we'll skip that one. So I think, you know, we can think about, you know, when we think about birds, the birdiest birds that you can think of, birds sing, they fly, they have wings and feathers. Um, usually when we're thinking about like a, you know, a robin or a sparrow or whatever, they're, they're not very big, they're hand size, whatever. And they lay eggs. That's one of the key things that birds do that differentiates them from other species of animals, right? Um, but when we start to think about all of these characteristics that we attribute to birds, the birdiest of birds, you know, what about swans? They don't sing and they're extremely large. Um, penguins still have wings and feathers, but they don't fly. And then there's something like a, a kiwi bird that doesn't have wings, still has feathers, but it doesn't fly, it doesn't sing, and it's a pretty large bird. Still lays eggs though. But speaking of laying eggs, what about a platypus. Platypus is not a bird, but it lays eggs. So if we think about all of these characteristics and which of these characteristics a bird has to have, um, is a robin a birdier bird than a swan is because it has more of those characteristics? That's what the rash scaling model analysis looks at. So um, this is kind of a summary of the two studies. They basically, Bookstein and Kidston in their two separate studies used the same list of items. And keep in mind, this is, you know, the early 80s. So library uses were in the library. You went into the library for everything, no remote access, um, their card catalog, all that stuff. So they ask, you know, is their respondents, are each of these things an instance of using the library? And if we look at, there's some you know, discrepancy between the two, the graduate library students, which are in the left-hand column, and the business students in the right-hand column. Um, but there isn't universal consensus for any of these items. Even among, and I find this really interesting, the library school students, who you would think would you know, understand that if you go into the library and you check a name in the card catalog, you're accessing a point of intellectual access to the collection that someone has created for you to use that it seems to me like a pretty obvious use of the library. They didn't feel that way. Only 70% of the library school students agreed with that. Um, trying unsuccessfully to find a book, going into the library, looking for a book and not finding it, leaving empty handed. Less than half of the business school students said that was a use of the library. And just over half of the library school students said it was a use of the library. I tend to get kind of worked up about this and excited about it. But the point is, if these students were surveyed and asked, how often did you use the library in the past six months? Students who had only, you know, gone to the library, tried to find something, couldn't find it, met a friend that would say, I haven't used it at all. So these studies, you know, were conducted 35 to 40 years ago. Surely we've addressed this problem by now. Yeah, chortles, right. Um, not to put these people on blast, but it, it doesn't take long to look in the LIS literature. It, just do a search for you know, use in the title of an article in one of our standard databases and you'll come across um, an article pretty quickly, I think that dispels this. So uh, these researchers, this was published in the electronic library. Um, their study, they did a survey of students and they asked them you know, how useful they found online library resources for their work. Um, they didn't define useful. They didn't define online library resources in the survey. They didn't define, you know, what's an instance of using one of these resources. Um, and the reason this matters, so I saw kind of like had a firsthand experience with a similar Kind of issue. Um, as more and more library use moves online and we can't see what people are actually doing, we lose that the direct evidence, the direct visualization of what people, how people are interacting with the library and its resources. 
as more and more library usage moves online too, patrons lose that understanding that they're actually using the library when they frequently are. So several years ago, I did a focus group with uh, social sciences graduate students, doctoral students. And we were talking about you know, what they use the library for, how they do research, how they get started, that kind of stuff. And one of the anthropology PhD students said, you know, I really don't use the library anymore. And I was like, what? You are a PhD student? You don't use any library resources? Um, I said, so do you use your own collection? Do you use materials that your advisors collected? Well, yes, yeah, some. Um, and then also JSTOR, which she accessed through the library subscription, but she didn't even realize that she was utilizing a library resource. It was a focus group, so I was able to say, honey, you are using the library. But in a survey, if, if we had just asked her via a survey, how often do you use the library for your research? She'd say, I'm not really, I don't really use it, not very often. So that's why operationalizing, especially in a static tool like a survey is so important. So lessons from Bookstein and Kidston, which you know, 35 to 40 years ago, we still are trying to learn. Operationalizing your variables is important. Um, not just operationalizing them for yourself, but explaining them for your respondents, uh, especially if there's some kind of, you know, not, not, it's not enough to just say, do you use the library's electronic resources? Do you log onto a database like JSTOR, EBSCOhost, Academic Search Premier, insert name of database here, and search for articles that you download. However you want to, whatever you want to measure, you need to explicitly explain that for your participants. So other things like not just the kind of technical stuff like library re online library resources or e-resources or circulation, whatever, but modifiers like good or better, often or frequently. What does often mean? Does that mean once a week? Does it mean twice a week? Does it mean once a semester? And most importantly, in my mind anyway, because I'm kind of obsessed with it, using the library or library resources. What exactly do you mean? Checking out a book. Do you have to read the book also in order for it to constitute a use in your mind or the respondent's mind? I also want to caution against what I would call built-in operationalizations, um, things that we data that we can access using things like counter compliant reports of e-resources usage, which you know, it's logging onto a database, conducting a search, clicking on a title. Um, is that a meaningful use of electronic resources? There are other ways to operationalize that. You could look at citation, which at least imply, I mean, people do cite stuff all the time that they haven't actually read, but it's at least a deeper level of use than just clicking on and downloading an article, right? Um, circulation, that's a proxy that we use for use all the time. Um, I'm a great one for checking out tons of books that I never read. And I think that's probably fairly common behavior. Door counts, just coming in the door, is that sufficient? And reference or research assistance queries, just you know, the classic hash mark at the reference desk. Is that helping us understand how that behavior or how that service actually helps people. All right, so Brianna's gonna tell us about real life example of this. Hello, um, just wanna make sure everybody can hear me online in, in the room. Um, Okay, so this is an example that is very much, I'm a newer subject librarian at University of Tennessee Library. And I came in for our psychology department that is one of the largest departments on campus and hadn't had a dedicated librarian for about seven years. And so I really wanted to know a general understanding of if they're aware of things and if they use things. And so the survey I ended up using and developing was kind of, halfway through being able to operationalize a variable that gave me a lot of information I can use 
to do better surveys in the future. Um, and so I decided to use a survey to be able to do that. So what I did first is I met with our library assessment team and I just kind of wanted to get a master list of the library services and resources that they gather information on. And I could also look at it and get an idea of what I wanted to ask my department about. Um, they also helped me develop some of the survey questions. I then met with five psychology faculty members um, and they gave me feedback on the survey questions. But what I found really helpful is they gave me feedback on how I was gonna describe the services and resources I wanted to know about. Um, and now those conversations also shaped what they wanted to get out of taking a survey like this. Um, and it really, they came down to, they wanted improvement of the resources and services that they were using, but also personalization where they felt like I come to the library and the library has things for the psychology department. So this is just a snippet of probably of 17 different items that I identified. Um, there were other like, demographic questions, um, how do you like to be communicated with questions, but I wanted to know what they were aware of so that I could take and what they used so I could know what I could tell them more about, um, even if they told me they don't need more information from the library, and I can do more precise assessments on the things they tell me they do use. And so these um, variables right here, this is what I developed with the psychology faculty when there were a parathenical um, description needed. Um, and then this is how I, I wanted to know, I'm not aware of it, I don't wanna use it. I'm not aware, I would like to know more. That's where I got a lot of my really good information. Aware, but do not use, and aware and use. And the aware and use answers were what I would take to do a more in-depth assessment where I could talk about, okay, Psych info. Okay, web of science. Um, okay, you don't know what a research consultation is. Let's talk about what it means when I you email me and I help you find an article. Um, so about 20% of the department responded, and it was a very large department. So it was um, I had 23 respondents. Um, again, no surprises. They say they're aware of and use the core library resources, our online databases, and e-journals. It was really interesting talking to faculty. They really wanted me to say e-journals and not databases, which is something as a newer librarian, I would have been like, databases, that's fine. They know what that means. Of course, databases index electronic journals. Um, and I was also, I was a little surprised to find that more than I thought used and valued the print collection. Um, but I did find they wanted to know more about publishing support text and data mining, and actually ordering materials from the library. 90% um, of them didn't know they could ask me to purchase something or, or request something for teaching, which is interesting. So this really directed me where I can do more precise assessments in the future about what they say they use so I can figure out exactly what that means and how they use it and if we're on the same page. And also a great springboard for I'm doing a workshop about publishing support. You should, you should come or be able to advertise, advertise more correctly and more impactfully to the psychology department. Um, what I really like about Dr. Filling May's approach to this and its operationalizing variables is you move from inputs and outputs to outcomes where this little initial needs assessment, it helped me establish those relationships, but also know how to make those more meaningful assessments in the future. Hello. Zoom people, can you hear me? I'm looking at Zoom, okay, great. So I, I wanna just say two things about what Brian, would you mind going back to your slide yeah. before we take questions? This one? Um, no, the next one. So you all may or may not be familiar with John Cooper Smith's project entitled 
library terms that users understand. It's defunct now, but you can still find it archived online. Um, it's Cooper Smith, K-U-P-E-R Smith. Um, he asked people to submit usability studies that they'd done, libraries to submit usability, findings from usability studies that they'd done and kind of aggregated their findings for sort of a meta-analysis and found unsurprisingly, when you think about it for a minute, people don't know what database means. They don't know what um, reference means. They don't know what uh, things that we maybe are, are so ingrained in library services that we don't really think of them as jargon anymore, still are jargon. And he has some really great recommendations on uh, as part of that project too that, are, that I, I think is a great resource still, even though it's no longer being updated and it was conducted quite a while ago. Um, but I'm, when I'm, made me think of that when Brienne was saying that her faculty in psychology want them to say e-journals. Journal is a, what he calls a strong attractor. That's a term that lots of people understood. Database, no. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention was that this step uh, that Brienne is talking about of, of consulting with her faculty is kind of a form of pilot testing, which is, you know, it's when you, you take the instrument that you think is ready to go, the survey or the protocol for conducting interviews or focus groups, and you test it out with some people who would actually be participants in that study and get feedback from them before you launch the whole thing. Um, it's an essential step in research or assessment that we often skip to our detriment. I've never launched a survey that I haven't said, you know, two hours later, like, oh no, I wish I'd done, you know, asked this differently or changed this. And I always pilot test. So even with pilot testing, I find that there are changes that I wish I'd made. And I actually, I said two things, but I have a third thing. Any assessment is also an opportunity for public relations and for um, informing your users of services that you offer. So, you know, not just do you do these things, yes or no, but I, that's why I, I, the approach that Brianne took, one of the reasons why it's so great is, you know, I don't know about this and I would like to learn more. She's able to collect data from that and, and collect, you know, she's getting um, consent from people to contact them and offer to teach a workshop or, or whatever. Um, so it's again, information gathering, but it's also when you're asking people if they make use of certain services or resources, you're also telling them about that you have those resources or services available. So those are the three things I wanted to add from what Brianne was asking. Um, but yes, we have questions, time for questions too, if you all have questions. And I think there's a roving mic or Right. And I can also repeat whatever questions. And um, if you want to put questions in the chat too. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, I'm new to the industry and I'm here as a vendor and I am really excited by your presentation. Um, because, you know, we collect usage statistics, we mm -hmm. collect turn away statistics, but it's hard to know what else we can provide libraries so that they really know that their resources are getting used. Have you found anything from the vendor end of things that can transform your assessment of resources? Um, well, specifically when you are like a subject librarian and being able to I get the turn away statistics. I get the, oh, you should really think about subscribing to this because it would be interesting. But getting a better picture of how they are actually using it and the understanding of how the different products might interact with each other. For example, the um, APA suite that is hosted by EBSCO and ProQuest, we get it through ProQuest. We trialed um, uh, psych tests which interacts directly with Psych Info. But it was really interesting because we ended up in Psych Info a lot more while we were using Psych Tests. And I was able to meet with the vendor and be like, I think that would be confusing. And I had a bad user experience with bouncing back and forth. I'm really glad they integrate, but working with faculty to get those specific um, 
resource feedback and be able to do those kind of assessments together where I have someone that I can share concerns with and I know they're not just going to go on a list or that email is going to be archived, but that's something that I can go back to my faculty that want improvement and personalization. And it demonstrates the value of the library and it demonstrates the value of our relationships with vendors. I have one thing to add, um, suggestion to add. I don't know that it's an active project anymore, but, um, and the question was, and I'm gonna paraphrase, what can vendors do to support collecting more meaningful usage data, right? Essentially, okay. So, um, MINES, M-I-N-E-S is an acronym um, that it was part of ARL's New Measures Initiative. Um, and MINES was launched like in the very early 2000s. Um, it was just like a little pop-up short survey when that you could contract with ARL to implement MINES and um, it just, you know, randomly every 15th user or something, the little box would pop up when somebody clicked on an article and it just asked, what, what's your status? Are you faculty, staff, student? Um, why are you accessing this article, basically? Um, I always thought that was such an elegant, unobtrusive model for collecting more meaningful data than just, I clicked on this link and I downloaded this PDF. My colleague, Carol Tenefer, which is a name that's known to, I'm sure a lot of you, if not all of you, um, also did a study several years ago, she did like a, several phases. She looked at, she and colleagues at other institutions gathered information about the faculty at their institutions who had been awarded grants, submitted grant applications and been awarded um, grants. They contacted those faculty and asked them, did you use library resources in preparing your grant application? Because I mean, grant application, you're building an argument it's, it's like a little research paper, basically. A lot of them said that they had. So they were able to then take money that had the money that um, the library's budget for those years and divide the gross um, grant funded amount for those institutions by the library's budget and come up with a return on investment. So I do like four dollars for uh, every dollar spent by the library or on the library, it's the library's budget. Um, those universities retrieved four dollars in grant funding. So any way that vendors can facilitate that, it, it, I mean, any assessment has to be contextualized. I mean, of course, something like that—it's not going to work at a liberal arts school where people aren't applying for a lot of grants. Um, any way that vendors can contextualize. Um, assessment in the mission of the institutions that are their customers that they're working with and deepen it that way is going to be, I think, tremendously helpful. Thank you so much. I'm specifically a product manager, so I really like to hear feedback about how these could actually be integrated into the product itself. So thank you. I also, one more thing. <laughs> so several years ago, um, ProQuest did, I, John Law, I think Jill, is that right? Um, they did a massive ethnographic study with undergraduate students um, going into, you know, they observed them in their dorms, doing homework, or like accessing library resources. Most libraries, librarians, even, you know, people, I do research, that's a, the biggest part of my job. I don't have the resources to do that kind of thing. The deep pockets are, comparatively speaking, are vendors that can, I mean, it's in vendors best interest to facilitate those kinds of projects that will demonstrate, you know, not just for libraries, the value of using library resources and services, but for vendors to say, because students use the resources that you contract with us to allow them to access, they, their grades improve. They're, so it's in vendor's best interest to facilitate those kinds of, to put their resources behind those kinds of big projects too. Absolutely. Thank you. There's um, an online question. When accessing a database or subscription, do you weigh certain types of use over others? For example, faculty use is greater than student use, question mark. Is faculty use greater than student use? Um, I, it's hard 
because at our one university, it is the faculty members that are bringing in the grants, but student success is a huge part of what we do, and we wouldn't be able to educate or inform students. So I don't think one use would be more valuable of the other. You would know maybe we shouldn't, if it's just a handful of faculty or a small department, accessing a resource and not our full full-time enrollment, then that might weigh into what kind of investment you might put into it, but I wouldn't compare like the value for a resource student versus faculty, but you might disagree. No, I don't. And, and another, you know, I'm talking about contextualizing assessment. Um, another dimension of that is contextualizing your, contextualizing assessment within the, you know, mission, vision, and goals of the institution. You also have to contextualize your message your reporting mechanism to your audience. University of Tennessee, I think that our state legislature, our board of trustees care in a sort of abstract way about grant funding. They probably think it's good. They're concerned with other important things like preventing um, any state agency from having COVID rules or, you know, they're, like they're preoccupied with that kind of stuff. Um, so they probably think grant funding is, you know, an abstract a good thing. They do care about students graduating from the University of Tennessee. Um, they care, you know, they allocate funds. They don't want students to take too long. They care about retention. They care about time to graduation. So, I mean, it depends on the audience for your assessment, um, which type of data you prioritize, which type of use or which user group you're prioritizing. So, I mean, the short answer is no. F faculty or student, is, one isn't more important than the other, but um, you do need to craft your, sometimes you need to prioritize one over the other depending on your plan for reporting the data. Well, and the assessment I did was just with the faculty in the, but it was it teaching faculty lectures in the department, but that's because that I was trying to get a sense of their needs and their needs impact students' needs. And it was kind of that beginning, but it does depend what you're saying, the context of what you're trying to answer. Hi, um, this is great. Thank you for sharing all of these thoughts. Um, I really like the idea of contextualizing uh, the data that we get about usage. Um, I'm personally a big fan of combining subjective and objective input to design the collections. So my question is, I guess, I guess I really like the idea of getting at the faculty the way you did here. Cause like you were just saying, it's not, it's not a dead end with the faculty. The faculty then influence other people. They influence their grad students and undergrads, right? Um, I don't like stopping with the library of uh, the librarians in my, so I'm collection development. I'm not a subject librarian like you. So I don't get to work with the faculty. And I, I rely on the subject librarian to tell me about their needs, but I like the idea of also just then going straight to the faculty. So did I have this correct that you only did this with the psych faculty? Have any of your colleagues considered repeating this? with their faculty or maybe the library doing it as a whole. And I have a second factual question. Did you say that 90% of the people did not know that they could request materials? Is that what I heard? <laughs> yes. Um, are you typing I'm the typing question in, yeah. the, in the chat? I'm, Zoom people, I'm typing the question. Okay. Um, so let's start with your second question. Yes, 90% of the faculty didn't know they could contact me to request materials. And I think that came from them being an underserved large department for so long and the way our budgets work, it didn't make sense to them that the library's budget could be used for things that they needed. But that was such a great, when I went to my next faculty meeting with the psychology department, I was like, hello, I have money and I can use it on you. Um, and so that was probably one of my favorite things that came out of it. Um, so assessment, and the bridge between collections and subject librarians can be tricky. 
And I was lucky enough, the assessment librarians that I consulted with, um, our assessment and collections teams work really closely together. So that's why I didn't want to start from scratch from what I thought would be valuable. And like collections and people in the library gather this information all the time. And so I did work with collections. And since then, I presented it to my other subject librarian colleagues. And I'm hopeful that I will have more partners and they can take the survey and adapt it however they want, but know that collections and assessment are there to inform and to maybe do it together. Because um, I have learned as a subject librarian, there's a lot of information that matters both, that matters both to a, a lot to both of us. Um, and we need to find a way to share that and that collections will know what's going on in my department and I don't have to always advocate and explain if we're all on the same page. So I'm hopeful, but we're in the early stages. It can also be, I mean, just speaking for our organization, um, there was a, I'm gonna work this story in because I'm, I, I, I love it. So many years ago when I was an academic librarian, one of my colleagues who thinks of himself as like, an idea guy. He's always, you know, like coming up with quirky and creative ideas. Decided that it would be a good idea for all the student workers at the University of Alabama libraries to wear vests like they do at Lowe's so that everybody could see them easily. So we were all in my department um, faculty staff meeting, laughing about this, just like, and finally, one of my colleagues who at that time supervised the students, student workers said, who will wash the vests? She, I mean, and we all just kind of like, yeah, good question. Who will wash the vests? Who will keep track of these vests? We were all sort of making fun of this as sort of an abstract, you know, on a philosophical level. It's always demeaning to them. But sometimes you have to think about it. And I think about this probably monthly when I'm, I'm thinking about a research project I wanna do or something I wanna teach in class or, who will wash the vest? What are the nitty gritty details that you have to work out in order to make something work? If you're gonna do an, a who will wash the vest moment is doing a survey of all the faculty at University of Tennessee. First of all, it's really hard to, to get our uh, OIT. They, they don't like to distribute surveys on such a large scale very often. And the provost holds that information kind of, their office holds that information kind of close to the vest. They don't really distribute it. You know, they want to be able to, to survey for their own purposes, which I totally understand. Um, how are you going to ask people in agriculture and English and theater and physics the same questions? Um, when you're building the survey, are you going to like branch off in a bunch of different directions? So it, there are a lot of you know, things to kind of work out if you're trying to do a really large scale study like that of, of the entire campus. It'd be different on a, a, at a different campus. Maybe, a, a, you know, again, four-year liberal arts school. It'd be a lot easier. Um, so these sort of like customized small scale, and when we talk about assessment being an opportunity for public relations, these small, smaller scale sort of more customized to the department and their interests and needs uh, approaches, I think at a large research university like UT work really well. Well, and I just um, want to reiterate the relationship between any collections team and their subject librarians. Again, it can be difficult sometimes, but that, I, what am I going to do with this information if I can't share it with the collections team, if it also doesn't have meaning and context, context to them? So my dream is that every subject librarian at my university would design an assessment for their department with collections, um, and we'd be as evidence-based as possible. Um, but that is an ideal that I'm not sure is possible. Do we go to a 1.15? I think so, yeah. Right? So we have about 10 more minutes for more questions if there are any. Anybody online interested in asking a question or anybody else in here? So the, the ways that you've implemented this so far have mainly been for internal purposes as far when you've surveyed a department's faculty. Um, 
have you thought about how this would work uh, with regard to when you're assessing something first step that you have to report upward, kind of like what you were talking about earlier? Um, whether I feel like at our institution, a lot of the assessment is done for the purposes of that upward reporting that we have to do to administration, iPads, all, all of that. Um, and if you change something, then long, your longitudinal data gets all wonky. And um, how does operationalizing terms and all of this work with regard to uh, those sorts of purposes as opposed to just internal so that we can do things better? Um, so with assessment there, you know, depending on what organizations, larger organizations, your institution reports to, you may be reporting different sets of data to your regional accreditor, programmatic accreditors, ARL, iPads, ACRL. I mean, and even if the data is types of data that you're reporting are similar. The ways that you're reporting at times, it may be different and it's a lot of work. My answer to you is not going to be satisfactory. Um, it's more of an evangelist answer. Um, libraries, I think we're starting to see this at larger institutions, not, you know, in some libraries, but we're seeing at UT a, a, a more robust effort to staff our university level assessment efforts. Academic libraries are still, as far as I can tell, woefully understaffed in assessment. Um, so libraries need to, I mean, there, there are only so many hours in the day, and if, if all of your time is spent counting beans for ARL, you don't have time to do this sort of more meaningful kind of assessment. Libraries need to beef up their staffing of assessment departments, first of all. Um, I think also to the extent that it's possible, libraries and library administrators need to provide feedback to the organizations that collect data Often these organizations don't operationalize their variables very well or clearly themselves. I mean, for the longest, ARL um, collected data about collection size. Okay, well, do you mean like unique titles? Do you mean, so libraries, and I know that this happens a lot, but I, I think a more organized and concerted effort by the people who report this data in response to requests or requirements need to give feedback to those agencies that, you know, what when you ask for door count or it's not very clear what you're asking, what, what do you mean by this so that we can be sure that we're collecting data in a way that makes sense to you? Um, so that's kind of a separate issue from what you're asking. But um, if, if there aren't enough resources within the institution to do all of that reporting and do more meaningful data, um, that's a challenge. Um, I think that liaison work is changing, uh, certainly from when I was a liaison and I did a lot more with the physical print collection. And uh, so empowering and training liaisons to do this kind of work, a lot of, you know, a lot of people in their master's programs don't necessarily learn about creating surveys and conducting surveys. So, you know, continue education for liaisons to learn how to do this kind of assessment, uh, needs assessment, I think is gonna be helpful, kind of off, offloading that or delegating that uh, work to liaisons and people in other parts. It doesn't all have to come from the assessment part, department, right? So I think that that is, is one thing. I'm kind of rambling here. Well, and my first thought, um, to your question, because you have a really good point. A lot of the assessment that my, at least my liaison programs do, subject to librarian programs do, is really just the how many classes that I teach, how many consultations that I do, like those numbers, right? Mm -hmm. But when you don't have the, the context to be able to explain it. So yes, I use this to inform my own practice. I also was able to share it with my supervisor. And also if I'm called on the, on the carpet, 
a hundred percent of people who took that survey knew I existed that like my outreach was working, that one of the largest departments who awards the most undergraduate degrees on campus has a dedicated librarian. And so that in the context of budget discussions of library value, I don't feel like it just stops at my practice as a librarian and what the collection looks like. It can go beyond the numbers and give context to ad admin, to other organizations, the value of the library. If there isn't anything else, I think that's it. Thank you all so much for Thank coming. Thank you. For stating. Thank you, people online.